Perfect. And Jeremy, you ready to share your slides or you want me to share your slides for you? Um, I'm going to do it myself. Sorry that, okay. uh, yeah, if you want to, you can. Bear with me, I have 51 windows open apparently. Uh-huh. <laughs> you want me to share? No, I, I got it. I got it. It's easy okay. to find only the PowerPoint one. So <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> All right, take it away. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Karen. All right. So yeah, we're gonna take a high level view of PI um, disclosure and research responsibilities. Um, you know, we, we want to touch on this every now and then. One, because so many changes have been made um, uh, since COVID and after COVID on, on PI disclosures in particular. Many rule changes have been made. Um, we update our policies and procedures and all the support systems try to help, but it's good to just stop and look back at what's a good list of all of the requirements, why those requirements are there, um, just so that we're all on the same page, we can at least know enough to say, okay, there's more detail that probably needs to be found out or um, at least why certain requirements um, exist. And it's all, I'll just say overall, I'm gonna try to make, keep this as just common sense and, you know, we're not trying to do this to, um, make life complicated for anyone, especially the PI. Um, we want to try to facilitate uh, the ability to actually conduct research as much as we can. So I, th I think first, when we talk about principal investigator, we we have we use this as a broad stroke because it's not only defined, if you will, um, specifically for sponsored projects, and there's a principal investigator assigned and all of the kind of attestations they do personally um, for taking that role. But broader than that, there's just a general context of it or definition. Um, and it applies to like IRB protocols, IACUC protocols, or just organized research in general. And so this is just one of those general um, definitions where the PI is charged to conduct research that generates independent, high quality and reproducible results. Um, and there's respond, inherent responsibility for the management integrity of the design, conduct and reporting of those of the research. Um, and, and, and so overall, when we talk about that responsibility, you know, it's their science, it's the conduct of it, and there's others involved, right? And there's other compliance requirements to consider. And so that's why the PI is responsible also for the direction and oversight of the compliance, financial, personnel, um, and other related aspects, you know, to the project. Um, and then there's this, you know, a plethora of systems to help support that, whether it's policies, procedures, um, personnel, support personnel in various offices. Um, it's all meant to be an integrated system to help help the PI um, conduct research. Um, now, that's the general intent, but it sometimes feels like it's a lot, and it is a lot. There's a lot of, lot of elements to research. Um, and I'll just say since, especially since World War II, those regulations have um, Kind of compacted, you know, and any time that a regulation is added, it's like none are ever taken away. So there has been a um, uh, a number of new requirements, complexities of requirements, and I'll say, look, research has gotten more complex. There's been various use cases that just we don't want that to, you know, issues that affect research. And so whether it's an agency, a university, a state, or whomever try to find ways to um, mitigate those those risks or issues from occurring. So with PI responsibilities, I'm just generalizing these um, overall. So there are disclosure requirements. There's the financial stewardship of, of research funding. Um, it's always an element. Then there's just the you know managing the project or the research itself. 
And that includes the, the laboratory environment, the conduct the, of the experiment, overseeing the students that are or mentoring the students that are doing those um, experiments, the collection of data and the integrity of the data, um, and overall, the, you know, overseeing and mentoring students as well. And you know, there's other regulatory requirements that come into play that are either federal or state um, or by the university. Um, and a new one that's been in the last at least five years that's been growing in complexity and new requirements across the board is research security. So this could be in the form of export control programs, disclosures for foreign travel, visiting scholars, outside funding, um, and, and even affiliations. Um, but we'll go into those in a little bit more detail. I just want to say, just want to recognize there's a lot being asked of our of our of our PIs um, in in overseeing uh, their responsibilities. Do we have a question? No, no, nope. someone just joined. We got you. So then, you know, and again, I want to, you know, we'll, we'll go into as we look at these disclosures and and responsibilities that. We're going to look at the how and why, and I know it may be viewed as red tape trying to restrict the ability to do something, but um, that is truly not the intent, at least in how we try to facilitate this. Um, I did mention new rules just keep, you know, get piled on. There's not much we can do about do about that other than take great care in the way that we implement them to make to make um, it less burden not only on ourselves but on on PIs um, in particular. But these all these requirements and the, and the disclosures the responsibilities usually stem from either a university or UT system requirement, state federal laws and regulations, sponsor specific requirements, and those have grown in complexity um, over recent years for sure. And and then in addition to that. Then you have this overlaying uh, bodies that audit you, investigate, um, and it's not just the PI, it's the institution as well. Um, and that and the and the oversight has you know grown in um, complexity and, um, and, and you know and in the the depths of their of their reviews. Um, but I'll go into that in a little bit when we get into these nitty gritties. And so, again, still framing the the system or the model that we want to have here is that we're in this together. Um, we're not trying to make it hard. Um, if anything, we try to pride ourselves in that we're making it easier. Um, and when we say we're in this together, there's a plethora of systems and support that try to help manage or mitigate those burdens that are forced or required of us to conduct research. Um, as I mentioned, all the different laws and regulations and sponsor requirements um, to assist the PI in, in the process. Um, but ultimately, you know, when we talk about um, the front line, it's the PI and the students and the actual conduct of the research. We're not in the lab, right? Um, so this is, you know, meant to just say we're we're supporting each other, and these are the reasons why these different systems take shape. So when we talk about research administration, I'm talking about pre-award, post-award, um, and grants and contracts. Um, I hope those are yeah self-explanatory functions. Um, also regulatory services dealing with human subjects, animal subjects, conflicts of interest. Uh, biosafety, export control, um, and so on. Um, you know, again, behind the scenes, doing a lot of work to to try to minimize the burden, um, as as well as safeguard the institution. Um, UT Share is, uh, although it's you know definitely um, trials, you know, with with the system, and we've had a lot of growing pains and adapting to that system. It is what it is. Um, Numerous people put investments into that, and it's meant to help um, provide, a, you know, the insight into the um, 
the financials for for our projects and um you know we have to collectively you know know how to use the system and how to um use it to our benefit in in fulfilling our responsibilities um where we can make it better we try we try to do that what's you know within our control um accounting and business services there's a lot of functions in there with you know travel um for you know for research travel or for um do you know generating invoices and the financial reports i mean there's a, a whole system of people and processes to support that procurement and following the federal procurement you know requirements for grant for projects there's a lot of nuance that they're you know that they can be that they're trained in and you know understand and we have different you know processes and understandings of those requirements and again meant to help guide faculty and departments in the procurement process. Um, departmental support, you know, departmental administrative support, our upper administration, um, OIT and, and, and helping to make sure, you know, data where it is where it is and um, assisting faculty in setting up different frameworks for data and data security. And then last, and, not, and I want to emphasize this, is that collectively, we'll take this all together, all the slides so far presented, our focus is on balance. We have a responsibility as an institution, as an organization, and all these support systems to um, follow these you know, rules and requirements to minimize burden, minimize costs, create flexibility where we can, and so forth. And I'll just say, um, in my experience, compared to other institutions, we um, focus on efficiency. When I say efficiency, I mean, for example, what is the actual policy requirement or regulation? We will meet that and comply. We do not need to exceed in our compliance because anytime that we're adding additional compliance requirements or prescriptions in our policies and procedures, we're creating either additional burden on ourselves and on these support systems and the personnel, the PI and its impact to the research and the timeliness of research to be conducted. And, and this is somewhat ironic, it can actually increase our audit risk. So as an example, um, some universities may say, oh, we need two signatures on a reconciliation or three signatures, whatever the case may be. Um, is there an actual requirement for that with the federal government? There isn't. There is for UT system. Um, but would we, you know, would we ever add to what, what, what's already required to us? Because auditors will always audit what your policy is, not what the federal require, not just what the federal requirement is. Um, and so by doing so, we may be creating additional audit risk as well as burden. So that's why I just want to say, you know, when we look at implementing the requirements, we, we take great care and pride in trying to do them the most um, least burdensome and flexible way possible. All right. Disclosures. So, and this is you know, different from responsibilities. I want to just, you know, set this clearly that there are certain disclosure requirements that we have um, as an institution and, and for the conduct of research. Um, so conflict of commitment and conflict of interest. So we have our outside you know, employment conflict of commitment policy. And that, that, that applies broadly though, not just to researchers, it applies to all universities. I mean, all university employees. But in that, there's a requirement to disclose outside employment um, that that may be uh, you know for a PI, right? Um, any outside equity interest, especially when it's not publicly traded. So this may be, um, a, let's say, a faculty member or a PI has um, interest in a startup company. Well, that wouldn't you know it's not publicly traded, so it's just shares or maybe even having a scientific or some unpaid role even, but there's still equity interest in it. And if, and if, and if we're doing business with that startup, 
there's a potential conflict of interest with it. So that's why you know having equity interest being disclosed is one is one safeguard, if you will, um, to help um, identify potential conflicts of interest. Um, new ones that have come up um, recently are foreign affiliations or talent programs. So this is um, has been particularly around the actions of the Chinese government um, in trying to safeguard um, either the duplication of um, of research here in the US or in the theft of intellectual property. So when I talk about a foreign affiliation, just give an example. We may have a faculty member that visits and gives lect lectures at, um, at a Chinese university. Well, in that process, the Chinese university may say, well, I'm gonna make you in this honorary title and give you this affiliation with our university. And we'll just pay you a small stipend to do that or to give you that name recognition. And that's an affiliation that's being um, created and gives the perception that, okay, well, there's a financial interest um, and would there be any you know, sharing of research information or uh, especially our own federally funded information that may not be public yet, may be subject to export control um, or sensitive and um, it just creates this affiliation. So it's it's a perception that the federal government wants to know about now. And so there's a lot of disclosure requirements now for like current and pending and other support um, or elsewhere where foreign affiliations need to be disclosed. And then some have requirements for um, talent programs as they're, as they're called. Um, and this has been the various examples in the last five years where the Chinese government may have paid U.S. faculty to set up a whole lab in China, um, hire students and duplicate some of the research that they're doing in the U.S. and paying them, paying them for it. And there's a whole talent program where they actively recruited um, faculty um, to do that. So now there are, these programs are either prohibited in other words, we can't give federal funding to those that accept these or that um, they need to at least be disclosed. So those were some new ones. And we've updated our, our conflict of a commitment policy to address those this new federal disclosure requirements, but also just as, hey, good business as an employer, we should know about these affiliations and who else is paying for you know, maybe some of the same work that the state is already paying for or the federal government is already paying for. And then there's conflict of interest involving um, research. So, you know, everything I was talking about before, we're just talking about, hey, this could be a conflict of commitment to the um, to the employment or the work activities assigned to individuals on our campus or conflict of interest. But when we talk about involving research here, we're talking about PIs that are responsible for the design conduct um, of research, and is there a disclosure that may create a perceived or real or significant financial um, conflict of interest for research that may have, you know, affect the objectivity of research, of, of, of a faculty member's research. So, um, as an uh, you know, as an example, if um, we have a sponsor that funds a faculty member's startup, the startup then pays the university um, faculty member as a researcher um, to conduct research, and they're mentoring students. Would the data generated that may be a benefit to that faculty member's company? Um, would there be a perceived conflict of interest, you know, involving research, right? In a lot of cases, disclosure is um, like the number one shield, if you will. So I use this cartoon here, um, you know, showing a medical doctor that sometimes have personal conflicts of interest in the drugs that they prescribe. Is it better as a patient to just know that that exists? It, you know, and it's up to you to um do with that information as you see fit um, to accept it or find another um, alternative so um 
you know, when we talk about conflicts of interest, there's disclosure, there's a review committee, and we try to manage those potential conflicts of interest where we can. And sometimes, you know, we have to follow various disclosure requirements. So some federal agencies may require the disclosure that there is a potential conflict of interest and that it's managed. Some may want details of what the nature of that conflict is. Or if, if a faculty member is publishing or presenting or presenting research, if there is a potential conflict that there may be disclosure. And you're seeing more of that in certain research presentations. Um, but sometimes it does depend on the publisher's rules um, and so forth. But nonetheless, that's why those disclosures are in place, that the university is aware of them and with, that they can be managed, and then also to help ensure compliance with publisher or sponsor requirements. Another area that's actually a requirement with the federal government is if the federal government funds you and you create an invention, you need to disclose it because they have um, rights to it. Now, this is an area that we can probably do some additional training on, hey, when is the invention real and needs disclosure? We have a whole office um, um, that uh, focuses on that disclosure process and provides guidance. It's under the um, newly formed Center for um, Economic and Technology Development. And then last, there's a requirement of disclosures for adverse events. So during the conduct of research, if basically in this, you know, some of this is common sense. If something disrupts, like, I don't know, a, a flood um, or other, other events that um, significantly impact the the research those should be disclosed and um made made sure that we're aware of it and that we can you know see what other policy require or federal agency or agency requirements that exist um, or compliance requirements that may need to know of the nature of those of those events okay and then we get you know more onto the responsibility side and we'll just start in the cycle of pre-award we have um, you know, budget preparation and justification. This is obviously one of the key areas that I think faculty work with our pre-award office on for sure. And I, I'm gonna go ahead and repeat my spiel on indirect costs. Um, so us as you know, a university, indirect includes our facilities costs and our administrative costs, FNA as it's called. Um, <clears throat> You know, the pay for the building, the lights, um, custodial, all of that. Um, and then uh, some of the core IT infrastructures under that. The library is actually under the facilities portion as well. Um, but all of those are real costs. They're costs already incurred by the institution. Um, and then with the federal government, we're able to try to recoup these costs as they relate to organized research. When I say organized research, the scope of work that we're asking the federal government to fund. The federal government, though, caps all universities of higher education in their administrative portion at 26%. And that has been in place for multiple decades. When, as we know, the complexity and new requirements, the complexity of research, the instrumentation and the cost of research has increased significantly well beyond inflation. The administrative um, burden on the new regulations and requirements that we have to follow have increased substantially, but we are capped at 26%. So when we negotiate our FNA rate with the federal government, our actual rate is around 77 and our negotiated rate is 56. So they don't even allow us to recoup the cost it takes to perform the work just for the federal government. So that's why I just want to reiterate, it's a cost of doing business. It is already highly subsidized by the institution and um, it's not a tax. So um, please limit waiving of IDC, request for waiving of IDC. We're already, we're already losing money, okay? Um, let's see. 
Um, so there is this responsibility of making sure faculty or PIs are aware that, hey, that's part of the cost just as much as paying a student and making sure that those are properly budgeted, they're properly communicated, and they're properly understood. Um, um, so, you know, let's not make uh, assumptions or, um, or look at this as, oh, we can cut here, all right? Um, no, we need to have a different, we need to have a more um, holistic approach of just the cost of doing, conducting research. Other thing to you know keep in mind are the salary rates and fringe. Um, you know, say this and that we are a nonprofit institution, so we have to budget at our cost, right? And so when we talk about salary rates, as an example, the federal government um, and these regulations um, on compensation, um, we already pay faculty to do research as part of their normal work activities. So for example, some faculty may be 40, 40, 20, 40% 40 research, 40% teaching, and 20% service. The federal government is only paying and sponsors are paying for just the portion of the research that your, our faculty are already paid um, for those research related work activities. So think of that 40%. Um, and that's why we have to budget at our institutional based salary. So it's at the cost of the institution for the research where they're already paying for. It. Now someone else is willing to pay for that research. So that's why we have to budget it at cost and faculty can't, or just in general, we can't say, oh, we're going to increase that rate of pay by X amount because someone else is paying for it. That's why it's not allowed. Or to say, oh, this is in addition to what I'm already paid. Like I should be paid a supplement for conducting sponsored research. No, it's it's what you're already paid to do. So that's why it's set up that way. That's why we have to set it up as cost. And same thing for fringe. So that's the reason for for why it's there. Um, cost sharing. Now this you know this is an area where we can we need to think of it as there's mandatory cost sharing, meaning a sponsor says to submit this proposal and be eligible, we have to um, um, we have to commit uh, some amount of cost sharing. Let's say one to one. Um, that's mandatory cost sharing. So we try to fulfill those as much as we can to just be eligible to submit. Um, working with pre-award though, we, you know, we always want to try to use in kind in, in ways that we can, you know, can meet this cost share commitment. And, I, and the reason why, you know, we, we want to limit a, our um, required accountability for it, because it's just a burden to track, um, and it is auditable when it's mandatory or part of the award, is that cost sharing actually lowers our F&A rate too when we go to the federal government and negotiate it. Um, the more cost sharing we have, it's actually in the base and it, and it brings down the rate to that negotiation. Um, so it's just another reason um, why um, we, you know, we try to just meet the mandatory requirements of cost share. The other form of cost sharing is voluntary. And this is just when a faculty member or PI says, okay, well, I'll, I want to make this look better. So let's commit cost sharing. And again, we want to think of ways to maybe leverage the resources that we have without quantifying them or making a formal commitment of cost share. So I just wanted to touch base on, on, on that um, of why it's there and, and what it is. And then we have different, <laughs> forms and processes to document that cost sharing for approval. But overall, the PI still has that responsibility to make sure that A, the cost sharing is met financially, and, and B, you know, whatever those cost sharing costs or programs are, that they actually benefit the project, just like a, just like an appropriate um, direct cost to the, to the project itself as part of that responsibility. And then I already mentioned just budgeting for costs and just keeping that in mind. We're not, you know, here to inflate the um, the cost of of conducting research, and that could be supplies or everything else. Just there should be a basis um, for supporting that cost estimate. 
Okay. Another thing that's um, come up um, sometimes is equipment renovations or program sustainability. So um, I'll, I'll start with space or the need for renovations. So if a faculty member PI is submitting a project and either assumes or thinks, oh, I need new space or new space will be available to me. No, no, no. It's the PI only has responsibility to commit the space they already have, the lab they already have. And so there needs to be prior approval. And this is part of the blue sheet um, to help identify if there are additional renovations or um, new space that that needs prior approval um, before we as an institution commit to it. And our deans, you know, want the, to be specifically called out as a specific ask. So again, that just makes common sense that PIs would know that and their chairs would know that they can't commit space they don't actually have authority over um, and need um, and need approval to do that in advance. Same thing, same, same thing with sometimes specialized equipment that may require renovation um, and so forth. Um, or sometimes, let's say it's a program and a large program that the federal government props up funds, but then in the proposal, we talk about sustaining it after the project ends. So even though it's not a form of cost sharing, the, there's a commitment being made that will continue to support and pay for that that program after the project ends. That that should have explicit and you know understanding of well who's going to pay for that and how is it going to be paid after the after the sponsor is no longer paying for it. So keep in mind again, more of a common sense responsibility, um, but um, we should you know, coordinate those things in advance. And the other is just if there's the anticipation or, you know, um, the planning to use human or animal subjects uh, or hazardous material or recumbent DNA, that it's best to um, formulate those, make sure that they are indeed meeting the requirements of human and animal um, subject research um, at the time of proposal. And lastly, you know, we try to encapsulate a lot of all of this content and material in our blue sheet, as it were, the proposal routing form. And that's it's intended to be a summary of what are the commitments and approvals for this proposal that the PI is responsible for not only submitting, but eventually conducting if it if it's awarded. Um, and, you know, getting that um, one just please do this all well in advance before the proposal deadline um, for all the obvious reasons of helping us all fulfill these responsibilities, right? Um, getting chair and dean approval of that routing form and the summary for it. Um, and let's, you know, help us help you um, in, in meeting those deadlines um, well in advance and getting better preparation for them. Help avoid problems from being created in the first place, right? Okay, so more pre-award responsibilities. I'm talking about, and this is an area where, along with the foreign influence in particular, many federal agencies, DOD, NIH, NSF, um, Department of Energy have all updated their requirements for current pending and other support. The intention of this, um, it's a specific form in federal, um, for federal agencies. The intention is, um, one, identify if the faculty member has enough time or availability to conduct the work that they're proposing. And, you know, so they would look at, OK, well, what are all the other obligations this faculty member has and potential time that it may take? And do they have do they have enough time to actually conduct the work that they're proposing? So that's one reason for this form. The other, though, is for scientific or um, overlap. And so it's understanding well, what are these other projects and how are they, and making sure that they are different. They may they may be similar, um, maybe extensions, but they're not necessarily duplicating um, what the what they're already being paid to do by someone else. So those that's the primary purpose of those forms. They have 
they have garnered a significant amount of attention though um, for the issues of surrounding foreign influence because and i'll just put this in um you know uh, i don't know generic term in that before when asking for that information and again for the reasons i just described but it was for that specific project being submitted right um now they're asking for tell us everything not just tell us what's related to the project i'm submitting and um and then we'll we'll and then we'll tell you if there's a potential conflict um so that is one of the changes that that has occurred and, and the inclusion that we you know put in here now and the expansion of these requirements is not just the projects that are pending or awarded it's foreign funding or outside research funding. So um, some is, and I'll, I'll just bring up a case that just happened this morning. And again, this is just kind of the headline, <clears throat> but as I understand it, <coughs> excuse me, some faculty at Stanford um, had um, research funding from foreign sponsors <coughs> in China. China has its own NSF as an example. Um, and the faculty member didn't disclose that research funding in their proposals under this current and pending and other support. That resulted in over the last five years um, of, uh, of an audit. <clears throat> the result of it is I think Stanford has to pay back $2 million. Um, that was the finding for the failure to disclose um that that funding um so i uh, just want to say it is uh when in doubt disclose everything that you have in these forms um the other addition is um for some of these agencies is those foreign aff affiliations and the other thing that they some are viewing as outside support for your for for pi um laboratories <clears throat> that should be included as current pending and other support is when visiting scholars are working in their lab and they have and those visiting scholars have outside funding support that that should be disclosed as other support in the lab um and then some are expanding the need to disclose research gifts um, especially foreign gifts um and again, is, is, are these creating potential ties um, with countries of concern, in particular China, and does it create <clears throat> a potential conflict of or uh, for the sharing of uh, improperly sharing um, research um, or the potential of IP theft? Um, so that's what's been driving um, the expansion of those requirements. And then other responsibilities. So some agencies will require data management plans um, or data sharing or reproducibility. Um, so you're putting it into data repository, the, the actual data, research data into data repositories and the like. Um, but nonetheless, the point is PI has a responsibility to understand those requirements for those agencies we have templates um, and the library helps support the development of data management plans. NIH has new, relatively new requirements on data management and sharing. They say that they, they may start audits of, of that. And so with those, we, we just need to make sure that we're following those data management plans as originally scoped in, the, in, our, in our proposals. And of course, we're talking about <clears throat> PI responsibility is the scope of work itself and making sure that we meet that scope of work. And like every federal agency, just as a basic federal agency requirement, if there's a change in the scope of work after awarded, um, we need to inform, um, inform the agency. And lastly, within the proposals themselves, this is all in the fine print. There are attestations not only for the university in the form of an authorized official, but also for the principal investigator of the attestations that they're making or the responsibilities that they are agreeing to when submitting a proposal or and or when it's uh, and if it's funded. 
um, just to keep in mind that it's it's just it's not just a university responsibility; it's an individual responsibility as well. All right, and then we have a number of financial oversight responsibilities. So when we think about just ordering supplies and purchase orders or things of the like, you know, it's not only following those proc the procurement process and rules. Um, like I said, it's not just that the university has a procurement requirement and process. Built within it is the federal requirements. I mean, it is specific for federal projects and if you, you know, and the requirements of purchase orders or for ordering supplies. Um, you know, it's 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 a federal requirement as well. It's just I just want to you know emphasize that. Um, but nonetheless, it's the wherewithal, and this gets into the allowability and allocation and reasonableness. The the reason why the PI is involved in this is to make sure, hey, is it is it appropriate to be charged to the project, and and also just I just want to say this overall for financial oversight. Faculty should never view project funding as like a collective pot of external research funding. They need to be separately accounted for for the scope of works that you know, were funded. And when we talk about allocating costs, as an example, if a supply benefits more than one project, it needs to be split and not charged to just one project because one project has the funding. Right, um, they're different sponsors in some cases, um, but nonetheless, um, those are the rules. Those are requirements um, for um, allocating costs appropriate, and that's why PIs are involved in some fashion. You know, for in with throughout the process of the transaction, uh, for ordering or allocating um, those costs. Um, or approving those costs. And then also I already mentioned following HR and compensation requirements, not only for the reasons I already, you know, previously described and that we're already paying for research, but um, there's still uh, our own HR compensation rules. So a lot of the federal government requirements are only applicable to the extent that we consistently apply them at our institution. So as an example, if HR has a limitation on how much of a raise or promotion that can be given to individuals, even though the federal government may not have that restriction, our policy to allow the federal, us to charge the federal government is going to be limited to whatever our institutional policy is. So in other words, if we're willing to cover it ourselves on our own money, then, then we can you know, charge the federal government. So there's a lot of other examples where those policies are limited to the extent that we're willing to pay for them with our own money. So tuition, tuition reimbursement for students on grants is one of those as another example. Are we willing to cover students across the board, whether project funded or not? And so that's why our policy does cover those and that allows us to charge the federal government. Otherwise, we couldn't charge the federal government for tuition because they're not paying for students to go to school. They're paying for research to be done. So just uh, just using as as another example um, where those exist. And then subrecipients. So understand when we have subrecipients. So we will be the prime, and we're subbing to I don't know UT, UT Austin two hundred thousand dollars for their scope of work. With the federal government, the PI, the university are ultimately responsible for that subrecipients, not only financial performance and program performance, but their compliance to the federal regs. In other words, if they have an audit finding, we pay for it. We then it's up to us to try to get it from our sub, right? That's the way that that's, this is actually structured. But the point being is it's emphasizing the, the PI's responsibility to just say, oh, I got an invoice from my collaborator and I, I'm paying it. Well, are they really doing the work to your satisfaction? Um, just if there ever is a dispute, um, you know, having 
proper oversight of, of that process um, can help prevent problems um, from occurring or, or at least limit, limit risks ahead of time. But nonetheless, subrecipient monitoring um, <clears throat> performance, their, their performance, the review of invoices, et cetera. Um, that's why we have PI responsibility um, for that as well. Along with a system of support in reviewing them too. But ultimately, um, it's the PI that would know if the if the program performance is being met and 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 seeing, hey, our invoices align with that um, with that work. Um, yeah. And then approving state you know transactions. So statement of accounts is one of those controls of um, you know being able to make sure that charges are properly allocated or on the account or on the project or if there's things identified on there that didn't belong that the pi and the department will, you know would be able to find those and there's controls to help prevent that or identify them and then and then um to swiftly um uh correct them uh, but nonetheless, um, that's why that process is there. It's to help give that snapshot and review it. Okay. And then there's some general just sponsored prior approval requirements. Um, and I emphasize this in that they're prior approval. So if it's already happened, it's kind of too late, right? So one is a reduction of 25% or of the time devoted to the project. And this is just for the PI um, or project director. Um, if that is anticipated, then the PI needs to ask for um, uh, approval for that. Um, and that is something that we wouldn't necessarily know because um, charging a project may be an indicator of work being done, but there are plenty of times when faculty or PIs are working on research or on projects, they're just not being paid from that source and that's okay it's just called voluntary uncommitted cost sharing maybe bad business but it's not a compliance violation um and it doesn't mean that the time devoted is lower okay so this goes more into like progress reporting when um when when recording number of person months um but just overall if there is an issue adverse event or whatever may happen that that calls away the time from the PI to the project, and it's reasonably 25% or more, then there, there should be recognition that, hey, I should probably tell the federal agency and let them know. A change in scope of work. Um, now, this is somewhat, um, you know, a lot of judgment for the PI, but unless it's the PI's responsibility to know and anticipate if there is a significant or you know a scope of work um, change that needs prior approval and then last for some agencies um, there are budget um, transfer restrictions or limitations um, most federal agencies like nsf as an example waive those requirements or those limitations and those um, and budget transfers can can be made um, you know within the project. And lastly, you know, and then, like I said, just kind of core to all of this is the allowability, allocation, and reasonableness of costs um, that applies to every single charge on a federal grant. Um, and then so it's one like knowing, hey, is this allowable? So for example, there are some items that are not allowable, alcohol, um, not allowed. Well, PI should have the wherewithal, should know that in general. Um, allocation I mentioned before. It's not about what project has funding. It's about what's that cost is, who's benefiting from the cost, including if it's the university, and then allocating that cost properly. And then is it is it reasonable? All right. So are we, you know, ordering 10 of something when we only need one? Right. Um, and so and so forth. And then, you know, when we talk about last, you know, payroll confirmation. So these are reports um, that are received by PIs. Um, but I just want to use this as an example of flexibility that we we incorporate um, for UTA. 
so I mentioned before, we budget and we allocate based on the institutional base salary, that nine month appointment of faculty are paid to do research, teaching and service. Once that's allocated, um, or, and then, and then a PI will say, well, um, I don't know, put 30% time, put 30% of my appointment onto this project over these three months, or, or put 100% of my salary for June and July, whatever it is. Um, those are estimates of payroll costs because we're charging the government that cost over a period of time and then what's required because they're just cost estimates because we budgeted them that way right then we have to say well did you actually do that right and so that's called the after the fact review and collectively we call that payroll confirmation it's confirming that the payroll is accurate and that's the after the fact review so um the minimum requirement is once a year we provide monthly controls or reports to say hey here's how your payroll is allocated does it and, and, and we also show the institutional base salary as a percent over the life of that budget period and it's just meant to say, hey, OK, is 20 percent reasonable for all the all the work I've done in the last six months is 20 percent reasonable for what benefited this project? And if yes, OK, we can confirm that payroll after the fact as being accurate. But nonetheless, we do this, you know, the minimum amount required based on this understanding that, hey, we have controls that lead up to that annual confirmation um and, and 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 also allow that flexibility that you can look at the salary over a number of months and so it averages out right um so like three summer months is 25 percent is 25 percent reasonable over 12 months that i spent on this project doesn't mean i only worked on it in the summer no i work on it every month right but you, uh, we, they allow that flexibility and we embrace that flexibility. Um, and then last, just, you know, having proper documentation and, and that it's justifiable. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of gray in, in research administration, in research, I should say. Um, it's not intended, when we talk about the uniform guidance, that's the, those, the, the uniform guidance is actually the term for the federal rules, if you will. And it's called guidance because it's actually guidance to the federal agencies for how federal money should be spent, right? Um, some, so the agencies have some flexibility in even how they implement those, the, the uniform guidance and those requirements. Um, some they can't um, alter, and that's dealing with the cost principles um, in particular. Um, but nonetheless, um, justify, you know, being able to justify anything that looks out of the ordinary. Um, so for example, sometimes we get audited, oh, we bought plants. Why would we buy plants? Well, we held this research event and uh, it was part of the event planning uh, catering sir, or whatever the service that provided that setup. Okay, you know, it's like, it, you know, how, how can we um, make sure that's still reasonable? Um, and then there's actually a term what a prudent person would do um, given the circumstances at the time. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, that's you know part of the um, PI responsibility. And again, I want to try to drive it down to some common sense um, <laughs> you know, situations uh, as well. Then we talk about you know the conduct of research. I mentioned not only the uh, you know preparation, scoping out a data management plan but you know as it's happening um and making sure you can follow that and then the other thing i want to mention here and i should have put a line on it is um confidentiality you know pi is maintaining confidentiality so if a pi agrees to a non-disclosure agreement with a company and the company is going to provide that confidential information to our pi to do research on it right um 
the PI has an obligation to use reasonable care to make sure that that's not disclosed to someone that isn't authorized. So it's not a matter of, oh, let me just leave that confident, marked confidential information out in a laboratory desk space that multiple lab personnel can can you know view or see those you know there should be um, security protocols or just again reasonable care that um, you know um, that faculty or PIs would would employ. Um, we have um, research security plans. These are templates that can help provide some physical um, electronic or data um, uh, or oral even controls around confidential information or sensitive research. That's just, again, another support mechanism that, that we have um, where and when applicable. But overall, it's just PIs need to have that common sense and you know care to just um, not be negligent with confidential information, whether it's a third party or um, or, or covered under export control laws or sensitive research and the like. So I just mentioned research security plans. Um, just one thing that is 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 going to be a new requirement in probably the next year. Our year from now will be this insider threat awareness. This is part of a national security policy memorandum um, where universities are going to have um, uh, additional controls around trying to, you know, just being aware of insider threats. Um, and, and this just may be general personnel that try to get access to certain things that um, are sensitive or shouldn't. And it's the wherewithal and, and, and having an understanding and training to um, identify or prevent um, being so open with with research um, and so forth. Um, research reproducibility is another area of emphasis with the federal government. And it's, you know, one, some are being uh, more explicit in saying, oh, you have to put your your research data used for publications or for your report into a repository that others can view. Um, there's certainly a movement uh, more so in that direction, but nonetheless, the overall point of it is um, the ability to reproduce results and having strong data um, controls, laboratory notebooks for, for students, um, <clears throat> And, and the, the data to support um, uh, publications. And then the other area of, you know, new responsibility, if you will, and that we've tightened certain controls on out of necessity because of federal requirements are visiting scholars and visiting scientists. Um, one of the things in the last five years for an influence was, um, Again, mostly by the government of China placing students for free, you know, free to our faculty in research labs where they know those labs are conducting sensitive um, or controlled research and gaining what they know or, you know, participating in that and then just either sharing it explicitly or taking it back with them. Um, so there's a lot more controls. Um, within the institution on visiting scholars. So we have agreements now uh, or screening processes that we that we do um, now for visiting scholars that go through regulatory services. Um, and another emphasis, um, and this is more around research integrity, is um, NSF and NIH. And with this NESPM 33, these new requirements that will be coming in place, are also new training requirements, not only for faculty in responsible conduct of research, but also in mentoring students. So that's something coming down down the pipe as new um, responsibilities for um, for our, our investigators, and we're we're looking at ways to you know document that one in ways that we're already doing. Um, but where we do have to have additional requirements is again carefully considering what those look like and, and how they're managed. 
Um, this is the last slide. <laughs> so responsible. Uh, so we're continuing with the conduct of research. So the PI is responsible for the progress report and the final and final progress reporting. Um, there is uh, NSF in particular put out a new notice about um, penalties of sorts of um, and um, inability to spend um, on other projects uh, if there are late um, reports. So this this will be an area that we'll, we'll have to be looking at more closely. Um, mentioned, you know, when we're talking about subs and research collaborators, PI's responsibility again of make sure, hey, do we have all the um, technical reports and did they do what they said they were going to do and do we approve this, you know, collective body of work from our subs and ourselves to what ultimately is submitted to the federal government. It is the PI's responsibility and it's overall the institution's responsibility for all of the subs. Um, and again, just with the emphasis on responsible conduct of research um, and some of the pressures, if you will, with obtaining tenure, ethical conduct or good research practices are becoming um, more and more emphasized. And the other thing, you know, when we talk about plagiarism or the use of AI tools, even, um, you know, uh, there's PI's responsibility, even for, you know, for their progress reports and final progress reports. Sometimes they may ask students to help develop that content, right? Or develop portions of it. Ultimately, if there's plagiarism in there, it's the PI's responsibility to check that before, before that's submitted. Um, so just you know, keep that in mind. And then um, the, you know, making sure, hey, you know, following your human and animal subject protocols um, as they are approved. And if there's a modification, needing those modifications ahead of time. Um, and again, uh, working with regulatory services in, in those changes um, and following those requirements. Um, that's doing them ahead of time helps prevent a lot of problems down the future. Um, export control. So these are when uh, some some either we are accepting controlled technologies or, or or technologies covered under ITAR or the EAR, um, or there's technologies that may have a military use. These may require technology control plans. When we have a technology control plan, that means this material, information, et cetera, we describe who has access to it, where it will be stored, what are the additional security requirements to control that technology and limit access. Because we, if, if those, so as an example, we, we cannot, and this, so this goes back let's, to that example, let's say, there's controlled technology, and a faculty member just leaves it on the lab in on the lab desk, and then a foreign national reviews that technology or that material. We just exported it to that's called a deem export, and we just exported it to that country. Essentially, that's what the you know federal laws are, and we may need a license for that tech for that country to have access to that technology or review that technology. So that's why we have technology control plans. Um, and that's the, you know, the gist of it. Nonetheless, it's the PI's responsibility ultimately, you know, to manage their lab, manage those control plans and, and, and make sure that they're followed. I already mentioned research security plans and then other area, again, of foreign influence that in part of this new NISPM 33 National S uh, Security Policy Memorandum requirements going forward is the screening for faculty, our faculty going to present research or even visit um, countries of concern. So if faculty member goes to China, take a clean laptop. What are you presenting? Why are you presenting it? Is it already public domain? And then even there, when there, what else happened? Maybe even debrief faculty when they come back. That's, um, Part in part where you know a lot of this is is going, um, but nonetheless, it's still a PI responsibility, if you will, of understanding those requirements. 
um, and and why we why we do them. Okay, um, that's the end of the slideshow. Uh, and again, you know, underneath all of these are various policies, procedures, forms, training materials, personnel to all try to help in these responsibilities and in disclosure requirements and what what they're done with them. So, any questions or comments? I've answered your comments that were in the uh, the. The chat, those have been answered. Um, Thank you. Anything, anything anyone has available? And if you're too shy to ask your question, uh, pre award at uta.edu, post award at uta.edu, and of course the big OGCS at uta.edu. And Jeremy's always open. Sarah's on here and she's open. So any yeah. questions, we're here for you. Yeah, thank anytime. you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was really informative. It was really good. Hope it's a basis to everyone to work on. But again, I just want to reiterate, we're all in it together. <laughs> I'll do it together. This is so true because without without one of us, it all doesn't work together. So awesome. Okay. Well, if there are no um, questions, I'll just say happy Friday and happy everyone Friday. have a great weekend. It's beautiful weather outside. And don't forget the eclipse tomorrow. Oh, I have to go find some eclipse glasses now, I think. Mm -hmm.